Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. Today we're decoding Mystery of the Isdal Room Women, written by Ilza. Thank you, Ilza. She uh, wrote the script. I'm going to read it. Never read it before. I'm vaguely familiar with this. I think it's one of those ones where I've like made a video, but it was probably several years ago and I've definitely forgotten everything about it. So here we go. The format of the show, if you're new, did I say this already? Not read it before? That's what's going on. <laughs> The year is 1970. The Cold War is silently raging. The Middle East is still reeling from Black September. And in the Isdalen, a remote valley in Bergen, Norway, tucked between some boulders, an unknown woman lies dead. The Isdal Valley, or Ice Valley, has another name, perhaps more apt considering its, considering its legacy, Dodds Dalen or Death Valley. Well, I was already one of those. Isn't a Death Valley called in America Death Valley because it's like super hot and nothing can grow there? Which is, uh, yeah, it's different compared to this icy one, isn't it? Although I guess like the two extremes, also not much grows when it's like mega icy. For over 50 years, the case of the Isdor woman has haunted not only the initial investigators, but all those following in their footsteps. Despite intense investigations, we're no closer to answering any questions posed by this enigmatic case. Who was this mysterious woman? And how did she end up dead in a cold, isolated valley? Why did no one ever come forward to claim her body or help solve the mystery of her death? Well, don't plenty of people just go missing and then they find them and it's, like, it's literally got a name. John Doe. Jane Doe. I think we call it Joe Bloggs in the UK. Or maybe that's not. I, I feel like our John Doe is Joe Bloggs, but I don't really remember if that's like applied to dead bodies or whatever. I've only ever watched, like, there's no CSI London, so I don't know. <laughs> so all my crime knowledge comes from CSI. <laughs> Was there no one who missed her? No one who noticed she was gone? Or was the reason for her death covered up by a government unwilling to admit their role in international espionage? Today, dear listener, we're going to present the case of the Isdor woman, and just maybe one of you will spot a connection that everyone else has missed. A little thread that, when plucked, will unravel the entire mystery and finally answer the elusive question of who was the Isdor woman. Okay, <laughs> no pressure, audience. You've just got to solve the mystery that has plagued researchers. Hopefully, in the next hour, I mean, probably not right. Just before we continue with today's video, have you ever found yourself caught in the age-old dilemma? Box is too loose, briefs too tight. Well, don't sweat anymore because today's sponsor, Sheath, have got your back. Or, well, maybe I won't say back. They've got your nether regions. Sheath underwear is absolutely the best. I am wearing Sheath right now. I'm not wearing this pair. This is a clean pair, fresh out of the packet. Never worn it. Although I suppose I'd wash it so it would smell like laundry. But I don't want to show you guys my used underwear. This is a nice pair of sheath. What is sheath? Well, it's a game changer. No more discomfort. No more awkward adjustments. It's just the most comfortable underwear you'll ever, ever wear. Look, spring is around the corner. It's about to get warm out there. And this is the perfect piece of underwear for spring, for summer. I wear it all year round. But you could do you. They even have, like, separate pouches for all your separate parts. So uh, you might you might think that sounds a bit weird, Simon, but trust me, just buy one pair of sheath, try them on, and then you'll end up buying more pairs. And then, before you know it, your whole underwear drawer is just sheath, the way it should be. It's got stretchy fabric, it's got moisture-wicking technology that keeps you cool, everything in the right position, everything perfect. Plus, sheath are now the official underwear sponsors of the UFC. So head on over to sheathunderwear.com and treat yourself. Use the code UNKNOWN for an exclusive 20% off. That's sheathunderwear.com, promo code UNKNOWN. Your nether regions will thank you. And now back to today's video. A body is discovered. On November the 29th, 1972, young girls ages 10 and 12 were out with their father enjoying a Sunday morning hike exploring the Isdor Valley. What should have been an enjoyable family outing came to an abrupt end when the two girls stumbled across the severely burnt remains of a woman. Oh my god. <laughs> Those kids are gonna need therapy. With the horrific image burned into their memories forever, the children and their father had to make their way down the mountain to find help. These were the days before cell phones. Not they would have helped them much, cell service is still unreliable in the Isdal even today. The two girls who found the body have never spoken to the media, which is not surprising. It must have been an extremely traumatic experience. Nowadays you'd be fine though, right? I was staying uh, at my uncle's house. My uncle lives on the Isle of Man in the middle of nowhere. He lives in the absolute middle of nowhere, in on a middle of nowhere island. <laughs> and I'm just like, I go to bed and I, oh, we arrive at his house. And it's like, there is no cell reception. It's truly in the middle of nowhere. It's the first time that my phone has said, like, SOS call available with a little satellite symbol. Baby, I'm scared. And I'm like, oh, sh I've never seen that before, which just goes to show how little time I spend outside of, like, cell towers. But it's like, wow, okay. But in this situation, would you use that? 
Is that what that's for? I guess not, because it's like not really an emergency. But you do call the police. Hmm. Right? I feel like if this happened, I'd look up on the internet. I know it's, it's just we're going way far off because this is the 1970s. But I'd look up on the internet, like, what's the non-emergency police number? Because I'd be like, yo, there's a burnt woman in the forest. The two girls who found the body have never spoken to the media, which is not surprising. It must have been an extremely traumatic experience. Yeah, I'd be just not I'd just be like, yeah, I just want to go on with my life and not relive that and then get hassled by my crime shows forever. Even 50 years after the body was discovered, one of the last surviving members of the original police party that ventured into the icy valley on that Sunday morning recalled climbing a steep, sometimes impassable scree slope and the scent of burnt flesh when they finally reached the scene where the unknown woman was waiting. It wasn't a pretty sight. She was lying on her back, her arms stretched out in front of her, in what is known as a boxer's or fencer's position. Oh my god, I know what this is. Do I know this from the previous video I made about this? But it's what happens when you burn someone alive. And for some or like maybe not even alive. But like the burning causes their muscles to contract, so it looks like they're taking like a boxing pose. Yeah, a position commonly seen in victims who have been burned alive. There we go. Her front was so badly burned it was impossible to make out any facial features. All the police knew at this stage was that she had medium-length hair tied up into a ponytail with a blue and white printed ribbon. Various items, probably belonging to the victim, were found strewn around her. Police recovered clothing, an umbrella, two melted plastic bottles, half a bottle of Clos de Liqueur, and a plastic cover that probably held a passport at one time, but unfortunately no longer contained any form of identification. A fur hat was also found underneath the body. All the labels had been cut from her clothes, and a wristwatch was lying next to her that had stopped at ten past ten. Is this when she died? Ten past ten is the standard setting for watches in shop windows, so it's possible that the watch had never actually been used. The police also found jewellery, but strangely the woman wasn't wearing any of it. Instead, the jewellery was placed next to her. Speaking with the BBC many years later, forensic investigator Tormund Bones remarked that the way the items were placed almost looked like some kind of ceremony had taken place. I'm also thinking, okay, if they, the jewellery was separate, was she wearing the watch? The wristwatch was lying next to her, so was the jewellery, which makes me think like the wristwatch probably came from where the jewellery came from, like the same shop, and the wristwatch is going to be 10 past 10 because that's the standard position for watches. Considering that only the front of the woman was burned, those at the scene considered that her death might have been an accident. Perhaps she fell forwards into the fire, then lurched backward in panic, stumbled, and fell down. Others thought that perhaps the woman had made her way to the icy valley to commit suicide. Couple of problems there. How many times have you fallen into a fire? Do people fall, like, I, number of times I've made fires while camping. Countless, literally countless times. Number of times I've even got, like, slightly burned from a fire? None. Like, I mean, sure, like, ow. Then you take your hand away, you touch something too hot. But actually getting, a, like, anything beyond that needs something that needs a plaster or a band-aid, Americans, it's like zero. Who falls forward into a fire? Others thought that perhaps the woman made her way to the icy valley to commit suicide. Oh, and with that, who chooses to like commit suicide? Like, I get that people do the self immolate immo immo immolation, get my words out, where like they protest something. So they set themselves in on fire in front of like an embassy or some sh to like protest what's something that's happening. But like to choose to do that in like isolation as a way of killing yourself is insane. A few considered the possibility that she had been murdered, and even wondered if the murderer was still somewhere close by, admiring his handiwork and reveling in the horror on the faces of those discovering his crime. If the scene of the woman's death wasn't puzzling enough, the ensuing investigation would uncover a case that even today has more questions than answers. It's weird that all of the tags were cut out of her clothing. That feels very spyish, doesn't it? Uh, I agree. I agree. I agree with you. Initial investigation. An investigation into the death and identity of the woman found in the Isdor Valley got underway immediately under lead investigator Oscar Hordness. Initially, the police considered that the woman's death was an accident or suicide. Carl Voss, one of the first men at the scene, mentioned the remains of what could have been a campfire. However, official police reports make no mention of a campfire, which makes an accidental death or suicide due to falling into a fire unlikely. Who the f is like, I'm going to kill myself and I'm going to jump in a fire? No. <laughs> what? No. According to the autopsy and toxicological report, high levels of barbiturates were found in the Isidore woman's system. The most likely source of this was phenomol tablets, a brand of sleeping pills, some of which were still undigested. According to the experts, she'd taken around 50 to 70 sleeping pills in three doses, the first dose a few hours before her death. The last 12 tablets, probably taken shortly before she died, were still in her stomach. The toxicological report found that the concentration in her blood was high enough to make her drowsy, but not enough for her to fall unconscious and nowhere near lethal yet. Bruh. 
That seems like terrible, terrible. Don't, don't eat 50 to 70 sleeping pills, for God's sake. That definitely sounds like enough to kill you. The report also mentioned that the pills were pink. Venomal tablets sold in Norway were white. Only England sold a pink variety. Unfortunately, the medical examiner's report couldn't confirm whether she'd taken the pills by choice or force. A second finding from the autopsy paints a more horrific picture. Soot particles found in her respiratory tract indicated that she was still alive when she burned. The final cause of death was determined to be monoxide poisoning from the fire in the phenomal tablets. The final dose, once dissolved, would have been enough to kill her when the active ingredient was absorbed into her bloodstream. Oh, okay, so it is enough to kill her. Or what? what? It, it kind of it both ways. The autopsy further revealed that the Isdal Jane Doe wasn't pregnant and had never had children. A bruise on her neck also suggested that she might have received a blow or perhaps taken a fall. Other than that, and the fact that she was dead, she was in perfect health. The autopsy findings don't prove murder, but it does raise some questions. If she had taken sleeping pills, she would have been drowsy. So how did she get all the way up a mountain by herself? The Isdor Valley was a long way to go to what kill oneself. Did the pills take too long to take effect, so she put herself on the fire? Or did she make a campfire, which didn't make it into the police report, and fell into the fire while under the influence of sleeping pills? See, now that seems much more reasonable than just jumping in a fire. If she set herself on fire, she would have needed an accelerant. According to forensic investigator Tormund Bones, traces of petrol were found in the ground, on the ground beneath her body, but none of the containers found at the scene contained any traces of petrol. That sounds like someone took some petrol there, set her on fire, and then took away the can. Because who's taken away the can? Someone else had to have been there. A Swiss forensic psychiatrist, Frank Urbanock, who studied the case also concluded that suicide was unlikely the traces of petrol further support this the petrol had to get up the mountain in a container of some kind and someone took that container with them oh and they left the burned body behind whether she took the pills voluntarily or not someone set her on fire before the pills killed her was the killer or killers trying to obscure identity if that was their intention they needed to bothered as investigators were about to find out the isdor woman had done a very good job of making sure that her true identity would never be found either she did that or the person who killed her did that i mean cutting the tags out of the clothes is a bit weird but maybe theorizing so far it's gonna I'm, i literally just pulling something out of my ass is like okay so some random person wants to kill this person killed the isdor woman so they get them to take off all their clothes and put on clothes where the tags have been removed so there's no nothing identifiable on the clothes then they get them to eat the sleeping bills to become compliant and then they take them up into the mountains they set them on fire and they die and then that person leaves that's where i'm at so far i know it's just kind of like wild ass speculation but wild ass speculation is all i got so far early on in the investigation a discovery was made that should have solved the case two suitcases were found in a locker at a train station in bergen the rental period on the locker had expired and when the officials opened the locker they found the suitcases inside and called the police the fingerprints on a pair of glasses matched those of the woman found in the isdal valley so police knew the suitcases belonged to their unknown victim with two suitcases filled with personal effects identifying the woman should have been a breeze however this is decoding the unknown not csi so the find only added more questions the suitcases contained clothes, two wigs, eczema cream, cream, and a spoon, among other things that you'd expect to find in a suitcase. Ah, oh, yes, things I typically, you know, uh, what's that show where like um, things expected to find in a suitcase? No one's answering spoon. <laughs> like the clothes she had been wearing, all the labels had been removed. Oh, well, there goes my theory. Because sounds like someone's going to get her dressed in these unmarked clothes, but they wouldn't also fill suitcases with unmarked clothes, would they? The label with her name and the prescribing doctor had been scratched off the eczema cream, and the police discovered glasses without prescription lenses, just clear glass. A sewing kit with the logo of the Hotel Regina in Geneva, one of the best hotels in Switzerland at the time, suggested that Our Lady had travelled outside of Norway, which was further confirmed by the presence of Swiss francs. This is feeling very spyish. She's just got like random glasses with clear glass. Like, that sounds like a disguise, doesn't it? However, notably missing from the suitcases was any form of identification. Not a single passport, letter, or note scribbled on a piece of paper gave any clue as to who the woman was. The Bergen police created a sketch which they circulated to all the hotels in Norway to figure out where our mystery woman stayed. After all, if she had booked into a hotel, all of her details would be on the check-in form. Yeah, because it's impossible to lie on those. As it turns out, Our Lady was memorable and the police got several hits. They didn't get a name, though. They got seven. 
Exactly. The Isda woman had checked into multiple hotels using different identities. Handwriting experts analyzed the hotel registration cards and agreed that the names were different, but it was definitely the same person who filled in the cards. Spy! She's a spy! I'm a spy! If we assume that one or two hotel clerks turned a blind eye for a little bit of cash, she would have still needed at least four or five different passports. Oh, right, because you got to give. You don't always have to give ID when you. Uh, you kind of do, don't you? Like most places, especially bigger places, they're definitely going to be like, I need some ID. I need to take a scan of your passport. According to the hotel cards, she was an antiques dealer visiting for business reasons. The only consistency in her hotel registration cards is a country of origin, Belgium. However, police couldn't match any of her identities with a missing person in Belgium, suggesting that all of these identities were false. Waitresses, hotel staff, taxi drivers were interviewed, and many of the witnesses who interacted with her remembered her very clearly. She was described as being in her late 20s to mid 30s with brown eyes and medium length brown hair. She was small in stature, but elegant, self assured, and wearing fashionable clothes suggesting she had money. Some even described her as exotic because of her dark hair and dark complexion, which really stood out in Norway in 1970, where everyone else was the color of fresh snow. She was quiet and reserved, not really engaging with those around her, and when she smiled, she had a noticeable gap between her upper front teeth. Hotel registration cards were completed in German, and she spoke very poor English. She wore a lot of makeup, and those who met her described a strong scent that could have been spices or strong perfume. Tone Svans, who worked the front desk at one of the hotels the woman visited back in 1970, mentioned that the woman was wearing a worn-out fur hat when she arrived. She remembered it because it was a style she'd never seen before. Many years later, when asked about the woman again, she added she had since realized that the hat was similar to hats worn in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, both Soviet states in the 1970s. She also noticed that the woman spoke with a lisp. For someone who's supposed to be a spy, she does sound like she stands out a lot. Which is generally not something you want to stand, you know, you don't want to stand out as a spy, you just want to be generic and fitting in. One of the suitcases also contained a plastic bag, which led police to a shoe store in Starvanger. Using the sketch, the owner's son recognized the unknown woman as a customer that had sold a pair of boots to her around two weeks before. He described her as well-dressed, nice-looking, with dark hair. She stood out in his memory because she took a very long time to choose her boots. In fact, she only came back to buy them the next day. He was confident she wasn't Norwegian. She spoke broken English, asked a lot of questions, and took a long time to make up her mind. He also mentioned a strong, unpleasant scent that could have been garlic. Police believed that these were the same boots she was wearing when she died. The last important clue found in the suitcases was a notepad with messages written in code made up of a combination of capital letters and numbers. I'm sorry, but no, like, if, if you've got a code, like, decoding thing, notes in code in your bag, and this is just some spy for sure. The notepad was sent to an expert code breaker who managed to break the code in about three seconds flat. Okay, maybe she's not a spy. <laughs> she is, she's a terrible spy. What looked to be a complex code turned out to be a travel itinerary, probably written in her own shorthand. For example, 23M23MO meant March the 20th to March 23rd, Oslo. Armed with the hits off the police sketch and the now decoded itinerary, the police were able to trace the woman's movements around Norway. From the 21st to the 24th of March 1970, she checked into the Viking Hotel in Oslo under the name Genevieve Larsia from Louvain, and from the 25th to and from the 24th to the 25th of March 1970, she stayed at the Hotel Bristol in Bergen under the name Claudia Tielt from Brussels. On March the 25th, she changed hotels, moving into the Hotel Scandia in Bergen, where she checked in as Claudia Tielt from Brussels again and stayed until April 1st. On April the 1st, she left Norway. Using the itinerary, police managed to track her movements to the Calais and Altona hotels in Paris, and she'd also spent time in Geneva. The investigators oh, are keen to visit and investigate both cities, hoping to track down someone she met or traveled with. But to their greatest frustration, they were prevented from doing so by higher authorities. Some of the investigators and the children of investigators who worked the case 50 years ago believe the Norwegian intelligence service was behind this. The Isda woman returned to Norway after seven months. However, matching a single letter to a city in greater Europe is a near impossible task, so her exact movements for those seven months are still unknown. At the end of October, our mystery lady returned to Norway after a stay in two different hotels in Paris where she checked in as Vera Schlossenek. She checked into the KNA Hotelette in Stavanger from October the 29th to the 30th under the name Claudia Nielsen from Ghent, and on October the 30th she returned to Bergen, checking into the Neptune Hotel under the name Alexia Zay Marches from Ljubljana and stayed until November the 5th. 
From Bergen, she traveled to Trondheim, where she checked into the Hotel Bristol as Vera Jarl from Antwerp and stayed from the 6th to the 8th of November, only to return to Stavanger again on November the 9th and checking into the St. Svithan Hotel under the name Penella Lodge. She stayed until November the 18th, making this her longest stay in one place. Perhaps she needed a holiday after all her traveling, but it's unclear what she was doing in Stavanger for nine days. Spying. Like, no one moves around this often. Like, this is, it's some spy for sure, right? After this extended stay, she once again traveled to Bergen and checked into the Rosencrantz Hotel under the name Elizabeth Lienhofer for November the 18th to November the 19th. Finally, she moved to the Horderheimen Hotel in Bergen, checking in as Elizabeth Lienhofer again, this time from Ostend. She left the Hordenheimen on the 23rd of November, and not long after, on the 29th, she was discovered burned to death in the Isdal Valley. Where she was for the six days, after she was last seen, and the discovery of her body will probably never know. Had she been kidnapped and held hostage by those who eventually killed her, or had she gone into hiding only to be discovered by someone meaning her grievous harm? The police investigation was thorough, but the lead investigator, Oscar Hordens, announced that the case was closed on December the 22nd, 1970, after just three weeks of investigation, uh, before the results from the autopsy and toxicology report were even available. It seemed like the death was ruled a suicide or accident, and investigations ceased. The fact that this came out like they reached this even before the autopsy just reeks of cover-up, doesn't it? The Isdall woman was buried in an unmarked grave in Molendor Cemetery in Bergen on the 5th of February 1971. A picture of the Madonna with child found in her suitcase suggests that she was Catholic and she was buried in a Catholic ceremony attended by members of the Bergen Police Department. DNA wasn't an option in 1970, but investigators hoped that one day she would be identified and could be returned home. She was buried in a coffin made of zinc to preserve the body. The coffin was decorated with lilacs and tulips and the ceremony was a simple, somber affair. In the years following the discovery of the body, many of the investigators working on the case have admitted that they thought the Isdor Jane Doe had been murdered and the case was closed too quickly. One of the investigators, Harland Osland, could never let the case go and held on to some police records and documents which his son, Tor, later used to write a book about the case. The case reopens. For a long time, no progress was made, but this changed in 2016. The NRK, the Norwegian public television broadcaster, along with the BBC, investigated the case using modern scientific advances such as DNA analysis, which was available in the 1970s. Their search culminated in an award-winning podcast, Death in Ice Valley, presented by Neil McCarthy and Marit Hagriff, and the Norwegian police officially reopened the case. Power of podcast, huh? Hagriff had spent years re-interviewing witnesses, tracking down evidence that was considered lost, and studying unsealed files related to the case. Her search also uncovered a few witnesses and stories that hadn't been told before, and to my knowledge, her search continues, and hopefully she'll be able to give the Isdal woman back her name, and maybe even send her home. Initially, it was assumed that the last time the Isdal woman was seen alive was at the Hordenheimen Hotel in Bergen, where she ordered a cab, presumably to take her to the train station, where her suitcases were later discovered. The last entry in a coded itinerary reads ML23NMM. This most likely refers to the 23rd of November, when she was last seen alive. Six days later, her body was found in the Isdal Valley. The entry has never been decoded, so we have no idea what the ML and MM refers to. However, after the podcast aired, Hagriff was contacted by a man who could very well be the last person who saw the Isdal woman alive, and he had an interesting story to tell. Back in 1970, Ketil Kversoy was a sea captain who lived in Bergen. While hiking Mount Floyen in the Isdal Valley, he was surprised to come across a small party of three people, which was uncommon at that time of year. The woman, who matched the description of the Isdal woman, was hiking in front with two men following behind. None of them were dressed for hiking, they were dressed for going into town. The woman especially was too lightly dressed for that time of year. When he passed her, he got a good look at her face. Kversoy described the woman as looking scared and like she was giving up. She looked at him and thought she started to say something, but then changed her mind. The men following her were around 20 meters behind her, and he described their faces as dead and wooden. They had dark hair and browner skin than was common in Norway, and Kversoy thought that they could be from southern Europe. He got the impression that the men were definitely following the woman, and she knew they were there but he wasn't sure if the group was actually together. The whole encounter just struck him as very odd. Yeah, they're definitely together, right? Like, they're both... They're, none of them are dressed for climbing into the mountains, and it's not common to see people out there anyway that time of year. They're obviously together, and these two dudes are like some spy hunters or whatever, and they're taking out her, this spy they found out, into the valley to kill her. For sure. Like, in my opinion. 
When learning about the woman found dead in the Isdal Valley, Kversoi was initially hesitant to contact the police, thinking that they might think he was a crazy man telling a crazy story. Agriff didn't consider the story to be crazy, and neither do I. And neither do I, Ilsa. But there's a problem. The Isdal woman was found on Sunday morning, and her last reported sighting was on the Monday, almost a week before. However, Kversoi insisted that he came across the strange party on a Sunday afternoon. However, he couldn't remember the exact date for this sighting, making it even harder to verify. This all happened 50 years ago, and so it's possible that Kversoi actually met them on a Saturday afternoon or that he met them on a different Sunday. He was just very surprised to see them. So perhaps they didn't expect to meet anyone up there either and went back down the mountain only to return for their dastardly deed on a different Sunday. If the last entry into a coded itinerary are referred to November the 23rd, perhaps ML and MM are the initials of people she planned to meet. Were they the two men following the woman that Kversoi came across while hiking in 1970? And were they responsible for their death? I'm going to make a big guess that yes, they are. These two were not the only men she'd been spotted with. Usually, when a woman is murdered, the first person the police look to is a romantic partner to rule out domestic abuse or jealousy as a motive for murder. However, despite being seen with multiple men by witnesses, no partner or friend ever came forward to identify the unknown woman. Hagrid re-interviewed witnesses, trying to find out anything about our mysterious lady and the men had been seen with. Some of those reports were given to the police 50 years ago, but for some reason, it appears that they never followed up on any of these clues. One interesting meeting with an unknown man was found in the files of the secret police who, after years of denying any involvement with the case, finally admitted that there was, in fact, a file on the Isdal women. The document stated December 22, 1970, and tells the tale of a fisherman in Tanaga, a coastal town in Norway. Berthen Rott claimed to have seen a woman fitting the description of the Isdal woman close to his home in Tanaga at the time the Norwegian Defence Force was testing their new penguin missile system. He claimed that he saw the woman watching the tests on several different occasions, but couldn't provide exact dates and times. Rot thought she was Slavic, Russian, or perhaps even Romanian. Even more interesting, he saw her speaking to other naval officers, presumably Norwegian, at one of the motor torpedo boats. In the 1970s, Tanaga wasn't exactly a tourist hotspot, and the woman's presence there during the missile testing is definitely noteworthy. We'll never know what exactly the Easter woman was doing in Tanaga, but we do know that the naval officer she was seen talking with never came forward to identify her or help solve the mystery of her death. Because she's a spy! <laughs> I'm a spy! After the podcast aired, Hagriff was contacted by Svea Rott, the son of Berthen Rott, who had an interesting story to add to the mystery. Shortly after reporting this sighting to the police, the Rott family was on their way to London for the Christmas holidays. While staying at the Stavanger railway station, the family was approached by two police officers who took his father aside and spoke to him for about 15 to 20 minutes. Rot Sr., being a man of few words, didn't say anything to his family about what the police wanted, and his family continued on their trip to London. <laughs> the past was the different, wasn't it? It's like, so uh, what were you talking to the beast about? Nothing. <laughs> it's like, none of your business, woman. <laughs> Don't interfere yourself with the topics of men. <laughs> Sometime later, Sphere learned that the police officers had given his father a knife and a handgun for protection. Sphere believes that his father was told to keep his mouth shut about what he'd seen, but Mr. Rot, the elder, had no idea who was behind it, or if he did, he kept it to himself. Sphere also got the impression that many years after reporting the sighting and the mysterious visit from the cops or someone disguised as the cops, his father was still looking over his shoulder. Oh, God. <laughs> An interesting side note to this story, to me anyway, is that the fisherman made it all the way to London and back carrying a gun and knife. Yeah, it's the different, different times though, isn't it? Clearly border checks weren't as strict back then as they are now. This would explain how the Isdorm was able to move across borders so easily using multiple fake passports. Yeah, I, this stuff was much easier in the past, right? Because like 1970s, you got a fake passport. If that looks real to a dude at the custom uh, at the border patrol or whatever he's gonna be like great whereas now they take that passport they look at you they scan it into a system i'm assuming that system is checking whether it's a real passport or not and whether it matches the name and face on the passport right i feel like you know that sort of was easier to get away with in the past nowadays it's like computer says no Another meeting was witnessed by Lillian Menas Cohn, a witness at the Neptune Hotel in Bergen, who saw the Isdal woman in the, in the company of an as-yet unidentified man. She described the Isdal woman as very serious, with sad eyes. One evening, she was serving the woman dinner and found her in the company of a man. They sat together, so they clearly knew each other, but they rarely spoke, and when they spoke, they spoke German. It looked like a meeting, as the man was reading something written on a sheet of paper, perhaps a report or an article. The man had grey hair, and the waitress thought he was probably Norwegian. 
Conn claimed that she told the police about this meeting back in 1970, but there's no mention of this dinner in the police reports. Cover up! They're covering it up! The Easter woman was also seen in a home furnishing shop in Bergen in 1970 by Siri Regvam, a young clerk at the time. She was with a man, and they were... God damn it, I knew Siri would kick off when I said that. Because <laughs> it's like their name is, is literally that. Okay, I don't think you heard me when I said it the second time. Let's carry on. She was with a man, and they were shopping for a mirror. <laughs> As you do. They took their time and weren't particularly friendly to each other. After a lot of discussion, which could have been arguing, they finally chose a cheap, medium-sized mirror. The clerk couldn't tell what language they were speaking, but was fairly sure it wasn't English, German, or Italian. The woman had curly hair, a description that fit one of the wigs found in her luggage, and dark eyes. Based on appearance, he thought the couple were Eastern European. Usually, shopping for a mirror wouldn't be that strange. However, if you're living in a hotel, why would you be shopping for a mirror to hang on your wall? Oh yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. It's like, why are they buying a mirror? They're on holiday or like traveling they don't belong here finally the isda woman was seen at the rosencrantz hotel in bergen with an unknown man a maid reported to the police that she went into the room that evening to prepare the bed as was customary at the time she was surprised to find the woman sitting on the bed with a man sitting on a small couch beside the bed the woman got up the, to allow the maid to do her job and the maid in a hurry did it as fast as she could during the whole time that she was in the room, neither the man nor the woman spoke a word. She described the man as around 25 to 30 years old, tall, well-built, with broad shoulders, blonde hair, a nice face, and dressed in a grey-coloured suit. The Isdor woman only stayed at the hotel for one night. The next day, after the visit from the mystery man, she left and moved across the harbour to the Hotel Horderheim. And she was, was she running from someone? Once again, it seems like the police didn't make much effort to find this man. In the 50 years since the body of the woman was found, no one has come forward to identify her, despite the fact that multiple eyewitnesses reported seeing her in the presence of men. Whoever these men were, they were determined to keep their connections to the woman secret, and it seems they succeeded. Clearly, eyewitness accounts are about as useful as the suitcases. In other words, not very. So Hagriff turned her attention to something that wasn't available in 1970. DNA. Who was the Isda woman? Despite having seven different identities, none of which could be confirmed in Belgium, multiple eyewitnesses, personal belongings, and a crime scene to work with, the police were never able to identify her during the initial investigation. Back in the 70s, the concept of DNA was floating around, but it wasn't used to solve a crime until 1986. However, before we get to the DNA, let's review what we already knew about the Isdor woman that could be useful in determining where she came from, which might bring us one step closer to figuring out who she was. Our mystery woman claimed to be from Belgium, but all the hotel registration forms were filled out in German, and many witnesses also reported that she spoke German. However, based on some language errors, it's been speculated that German wasn't her first language. She might have been using German as another way of hiding her true identity. As an experienced language teacher and editor, I've met several language speakers with atrocious grammar who couldn't spell if their lives depended on it, so I'm not convinced this proves anything. In fact, according to one article, she listed the Brussels district office as her passport issuing authority. Apparently, this expression was only used during the Nazi occupation, suggesting that German was, in fact, her first language. In more recent years, a handwriting expert also jo joined the search for the unknown woman's identity and took a look at the hotel registration forms, hoping to learn something about the elusive woman from her handwriting. Based on this analysis, the expert concluded that our woman probably received her primary education in France or a French-speaking part of either Belgium or Switzerland. The expert spotted some idiosyncrasies, such as the double strokes used for the lowercase t that was commonly used in France at the time, and the underlining of the signature. French speakers typically underline their signature, starting from the initial of the first name. Of course, this is not conclusive, but if she was a first language French speaker trying to hide her identity, it might explain the language mistakes. Yeah, I think that's fine. Like, yeah, people make language mistakes in their first language, but I feel people, like, if I come across someone and it's like, is English their first language? Almost always I'll be like, yeah, it is. Or no, it isn't. There's very few times in my life where someone has been like, oh no, I actually speak this language better. English isn't my first language. And you're just like, you're what the f**k? <laughs> I think it's happened twice in my whole life where you've been like, wait, English isn't your first language? How the f do you speak it so well? When the investigation was reopened in 2016, authorities hoped that DNA might finally provide an answer. In 1970, despite not having access to DNA testing, it was standard practice to keep tissue samples from an autopsy. Thankfully, these samples were stored properly and still usable after 50 years, and provided a complete DNA profile of the Isdor woman. Using a mitochondrial DNA profile, the DNA that connects us with our ancestors on our mother's side, forensic expert Professor Walter Parson determined that the Isdor woman was definitely of European descent. 
With a DNA profile in hand, police rechecked all their databases and even sent a new profile to Interpol hoping for a match but came up empty. This leaves the databases of private genealogy labs and companies like the ones helping people find lost relatives. Unfortunately, there are ethical and legal issues in Norway regarding the use of these private databases in the course of criminal investigations since not everyone who hands over their DNA to these private companies have anything to do with criminal activity. However, these databases can be checked in the future to provide, if not the Isdorman's identity, perhaps the identity of a close relative. Before being buried, the Isdor woman's jaw was removed, with the hope that the teeth might help identify her at some point in the future. Can't we just take an x-ray of the teeth or something? You have to just cut off the jaw? Jesus! Initially, the jaw and teeth were kept by a professor of dentistry, but after his death, it was assumed that the jaw had been thrown away. However, after renewed interest in the case, some investigation led to the discovery of the jaw and the teeth in a cellar at Hawkeland University Hospital's forensic archives. With the forensic techniques available, the jaw and teeth became a valuable clue. Much like the Isdor woman herself, her teeth were distinctive. She had 14 fillings and several golden crowns. This was odd considering her age. She was supposedly in her late 20s to mid 30s. It also wasn't typical of the dental work done in Norway at the time. Gold work was done in Germany and Austria and commonly seen in Eastern Europe. Carbon 14 testing was also done at Karolinska Institute in Stockholm in order to determine the Isdor woman's age. By matching the level of carbon 14 in the atmosphere with the carbon 14 found in the dental enamel, scientists can get a fair estimate of when someone was born. Based on her hotel registration cards and witnesses' reports, the woman was probably born in the 1940s. The registration cards usually indicated 1942 or 1943. However, the results of the carbon-14 test revealed something unexpected. According to the tests, the woman was around 45 when she died, meaning she was born in the 1930s or even the 1920s. Wow, so she must look good for her age. Carbon-14 testing on teeth is apparently very accurate, according to the experts, and people are very bad at judging ages. However, I find it unlikely that all the witnesses would mistake a 45-year-old woman for a woman in her late 20s or early 30s, no matter how much makeup she was wearing. Yeah, but some people just look young. They really do. It's clear from this test, even if the dates are a little off, that the Isda woman was lying about her age, pretending to be younger than she actually was. And that makes sense. In the 1970s, a woman in her 40s was expected to be married with children. A woman traveling alone was already a rare sight. A married woman traveling without her kids and husband would have raised even more eyebrows. It's possible she was pretending to be younger in order for her status as a single woman traveling alone to be more acceptable. The Norwegian Criminal Investigation Service, along with the University of Bergen, also conducted isotope analysis on the teeth. Traces of chemicals in the ground and water are deposited in the teeth as they're being formed. By analyzing these chemical signatures, scientists can determine what area a person might originally have hailed from. Based on the isotope analysis, our lady was most likely born in southeastern Germany around Nuremberg. The analysis also shows that she probably moved around a lot in her youth, and areas she could have lived in include northern Wales, western Germany, Belgium, and parts of France. She's getting around. She spoke German and probably learned to write in a French region, so her most likely place of residence in her teens would be the French-German border or the Luxembourg-Belgium area. Historically speaking, the late 20s and early 30s in Nuremberg was a significant place to be. It was the spiritual heart of Nazi Germany and fully supported with great enthusiasm the rise of Hitler in the Nuremberg rallies. The pre-war and war years saw a lot of population movement around Europe, especially in Germany. We have no way of knowing whether the Isdormans movements as a child had anything to do with the war, but living in Nuremberg would have given the Isdormans and her family a front row seat to the rise of Hitler. Many Jewish families saw the writing on the wall and left Nuremberg at the first opportunity. It's possible the Isdormans and her family were among those refugees. Her broken English and dental work suggested that she wasn't one of 10,000 children who escaped Germany for northern Wales through the Kindertransport after Kristallnacht on November the 9th, 1938. However, many families, both Jewish and non-Jewish, sent their children to family and friends living westward, so toward Belgium and the border between France and Germany. The isotope testing and handwriting analysis certainly supports the theory that the Isdor woman was sent west as a child. While doing research for the podcast, Hagrid and McCarthy came across the Maria Rosenberg School. I couldn't find any records for this school, but I don't have access to German school records, so I have to rely on their research. Apparently, the Maria Rosenberg School housed young women and girls without families. According to one historical expert, the Maria Rosenberg School was also used for children with behavioral problems, many of them from Nuremberg, but to his knowledge, no Jewish children were hidden at the school during the war. When looking at student records for the school, a familiar name popped up, Claudia Tielt, one of the names used by the Isdor woman. Oh, hello. 
However, the records were incomplete, so there's no way of following up on this lead. A refugee, orphan, or child alienated from their family due to behavioral problems would make an ideal candidate for any clandestine operation. Yeah, this place sounds like exactly the sort of place where they'd recruit potential spies from. Be it espionage or a criminal enterprise. With vague or non-existent documentation of their lives and no family or friends to miss them, they could easily disappear without anyone noticing that they're gone. The police followed up on all the names the Isda women used and they never found anything. By the time World War II ended, people had gone missing. Families were separated, getting stuck on the wrong side of the Berlin Wall, and records had been destroyed in bombing raids and fires. If our women had gone missing in Germany or Belgium during or even right after the war, there's a good chance that a case simply fell through the cracks. There was no one left to miss her and follow up with the police. It was like she never even existed. A spy in our midst. Messages written in code, wigs, multiple identities, no history. Our lady was a spy, right? Yes! If we consider the Is Dorwin's movements in her final hours, this certainly seems like a very good possibility. According to the lead investigator, Oscar Hordness, there was no indication that the victim was involved in any kind of espionage, stating that oh, we can rule that out with certainty. Why can you be? How can you be so certain? It also sounds like throughout their investigation, they were getting leaned on by someone. And so that would be very congruent with the fact that they've been leaned on by someone, and by someone I mean spy services. However, many people disagree. The 1970s was a busy time politically. The Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union was in full swing, and nuclear war had barely been averted just eight years before, in October 1962. In the far north above the Arctic Circle, Norway and the Soviet Union shared a 200-long kilometer border. However, Norway was firmly allied with the United States. The city of Bergen, where the Isdor woman spent a lot of her time, was home to the biggest naval base in Norway. Soldiers in the streets were a fairly common sight, and NATO exercises with warships from the US, Germany, and England were a regular occurrence. This made the Soviet Union quite nervous, so a lot of submarine sightings were reported in the Fords, most likely the Soviets keeping an eye on what NATO was doing. Bergen also housed an international airport. With all this activity and access, Bergen would have been a good place for a spy to pick up intel. Starting in the 1960s, Norway, with financial support from the US Navy and Western Germany, began developing the Penguin Missile System, a short-range anti-ship missile. The development took around a decade, and the missile was finally put into service in 1972 and became NATO's first operation on naval strike missile, so the project was of great importance to all the players in the Cold War. And they're spies. And they're spies. I don't understand how this could be like, no, definitely not a spy. Nothing to do with spies, except everything is saying this is all to do with spies. Investigations into the Isdor women's movements showed that her visits to Stavanger and Bergen coincided with the tests of the Penguin missile system, and personnel from the FFI, the Norwegian Defence Research Establishment, stayed at hotels in Stavanger during the tests. According to the tale of our fisherman, the Isdor woman was watching the exercises of the 25th Missile Boat Squadron in Tanaga, where she was also seen talking to a naval officer. While none of this proves that she was a spy, her presence is definitely suspicious, and considering the importance of this newly developed weapon system, the Isdor woman being a soviet spy is certainly within the realm of possibility unless i am missing something and i know it's like one of those things where it's like okay so there's no evidence but oh my god the amount of circumstantial evidence is crazy however the cold war wasn't the only thing happening to the world in the 1970s in the summer of 1973 a special unit of Mossad assassinated ahmed bachiki a waiter openly in the street in the town of Lillehammer, a ski resort town in southern Norway. The Mossad agents had mistaken Bachiki for Ali Hassan Salamer, a Palestinian man involved in the Munich massacre at the Olympic Games in 1972. The incident in Lillehammer opened a whole new can of worms. The Norwegian authorities were very lenient toward the Mossad agents that shot an innocent man on the street, giving them a very short prison sentence. This all happened three years after the Isdor woman was found dead, but it suggests that the Mossad was operating in Norway in the 1970s. So if not a Soviet spy, was the woman connected to Mossad in some way? According to Professor Stephen Dorrell of Huddersfield University, an expert in Western counterintelligence, the Mossad was quite adept at passports and certainly had the capacity to manage an agent with multiple identities. Yeah, I mean, sure, but so does the Soviet Union. You can bet they can forge passports. Didn't they have, like, agents literally in the United States pretending to be Americans? At least according to that Americans TV show? Unlike the Soviets, they were also more likely to use female spies. If the Norwegian government was so lenient toward foreign secret service agents operating openly in Norway, perhaps the case of the Isdor woman was closed so quickly to hide the involvement of intelligence agencies, either foreign or domestic. Yeah. Yeah. Yes!
<laughs> yes, exactly. Oh my god, yes. Oh my god, yes. Now, other than hunting down terrorists and Nazi war criminals, what interest would Israel have in Norway? Well, I'm glad you asked. Norway is a producer of heavy water, a component used for nuclear fission with both civilian and military applications. In 1970, Norway delivered one ton of heavy water to Israel, following Israel's guarantee that the water would be used for a nuclear reactor and not for anything military, like, you know, a nuclear bomb. The whole transaction was kept secret. Perhaps news of Israel's interest in a component that could be used for nuclear weapons made its way to Palestinian ears, prompting the Palestinians to take a closer look at what was happening in Norway. If this was the reason behind the Isdor woman's visit to Norway, it would make sense that the Norwegian intelligence services wanted it kept quiet. The Cold War was still going strong. Getting openly involved in a second conflict was not a good idea. So. Do we have anything linking the Isdor woman to Palestinian groups? There is one very tenuous link, but it might also explain another question regarding the Isdor woman, the money. I don't understand why it's like, why we're considering Israel, Mossad, or Palestinian spies when it just seems like the Soviet Union is the obvious ass choice here. The Isdor woman was well funded. She was described as elegant, stayed in upmarket hotel in Geneva, and traveled around Europe constantly. Clearly, our lady had money, and lots of it. So where was the money coming from? An independent fact-checker made an interesting connection. Francois Genot, a wealthy financier from Switzerland with close ties to Belgium, having married a Belgian national. Genot was a man with all the wrong friends. Long after the Third Reich toppled, he still remained an avid supporter of National Socialism and Hitler, and continued his fight against the Jews via the Israel-Palestine conflict. Genot visited Paris on the 26th of June and 27th of June 1970 to meet with Wadi Haddad, a well-known Palestinian militant. While there are no reports of a woman present at this meeting, which was observed by intelligence agents, we know that the Isdor woman was in Paris at the same time. Now, now Paris is a big city, so this link is tenuous at best. Yes, but after 50 years, we've reached the point in the case where armchair detectives start grasping at straws. But if the Isdor woman was involved with Genoa and Haddad, it would explain where the money came from. You know what would also explain where the money came from? State sponsorship. <laughs> like, you know what has lots of money? Governments. While the spy theory certainly makes sense to us mere mortals, those with a little more insight into spycraft have a different opinion. According to Ivan Newman, director of Norwegian Social Records, spy operations at the time uh, were set up as follows. As a spy, you had an officer you had to report to. In the Soviet days, there would be one person working in the embassy known as the residence. They would be the ranking intelligence officer. Their job was to maintain relationships and recruit agents. Next in your hierarchy, you would have the professional or career spies. They, in turn, would have networks of informants, passing them information as well as couriers and messengers. Some of these informants would be paid while others did it for ideological reasons. A proper spy would be provided with a legend, a backstory which includes a full life history with the proper documentation to bank that up. A spy would certainly have one or two false identities, but it was unlikely for a spy to have seven different identities. Keeping that many backstories straight without tripping yourself up would be very difficult, even for a professional spy. I mean, yeah, sure, if you had seven fully fleshed out backstories, but you could have like one or two or three fully fleshed out backstories, which you can keep, you know, keep on top of, and then just have some random names that you just use for checking into hotels or booking flights. And then that's as deep as they go. You don't need every identity to be super in-depth, you just need some of them to be in depth for more complicated stuff and then some of them not to be in depth for stuff where no one's ever going to ask questions no one's going to check you into a hotel and be like and so where did you go to university no one's asking that and if you're only using the identity for that then it doesn't need to be deeper smart i still think this is spies it's spies former spy alexander vasiliev believes that if our lady was a spy she wasn't a soviet spy she had she cut all the labels out of her clothes, like she didn't want to be traced through her purchases. A proper spy wouldn't do that. Instead, a spy would be wearing clothes bought from Norway or another country that fit her legend. Since she claimed to be from Belgium in her hotel registrations, a proper spy would be wearing clothes from stores commonly found in Belgium to further cement her false identity. This door woman also had too many different identities for a Soviet spy. Faking an identity requires a lot of effort and paperwork. Again, if it's a if it's a if it's got a big legend, sure. But not if it doesn't. She would need birth certificates, driver's licenses, and identity documents from her home country. No, she wouldn't. She might just need a fake passport to check into a hotel. A paper trail needs to be established, and she would need more than just a passport. I just disagree with this. I just straight up disagree with this. Like, you can have a shallow false identity. 
This takes money, time, and effort to organize. You don't just buy these things off a shelf. Ideally, a spy would take the name of a deceased person. So seven identities would mean seven deceased people. In the 1970s, it also wasn't uncommon for women to travel alone. A woman on her own drew attention, so the Soviet Union didn't use a lot of female spies in order to fly under the radar. Finally, more than one person commented on the smell of spices, strong perfume, or garlic. Once again, this is out of the norm, making it memorable. According to Vasiliev, a Soviet spy would smell of Chanel No. 5. <laughs> okay. Our Lady was also traveling too often to be a spy. A spy needs to build up a network of informants in an area, make friends, and become a trusted member of the community. If she was interested in something like the Penguin Missile Test, she would have been staying in Bergen or Stavanger for years, making friends with the locals and taking a dog for a walk to watch the tests without drawing attention. Traveling extensively would make it impossible to build up a network. Vasiliev considers the money and multiple identities to be suspicious, but if she was a spy, she definitely wasn't a Soviet spy. It sounds like he's just like, yeah, no, no, she wasn't one of our spies. Definitely not. <laughs> I mean, spies, they have a vested interest in keeping how they operate secrets. So I just don't buy it. It's too spyy. However, just because she wasn't a spy doesn't mean she wasn't involved in espionage. This was the days before super fast internet and overnight delivery services. The only way for a spy to get important information into the hands of handlers was through couriers. Considering some of the high profile cities the Isda woman visited, such as Hamburg in Germany, Basel in Switzerland, Paris and Rome, it's possible that our woman wasn't a spy but a courier working for an espionage ring operating in Norway, a ring involving some high ranking Norwegian officials. Perhaps she made a mistake and as a result was killed and put on a fire to hide her identity and cover up the involvement of some very important people with a lot to lose. Fine, so she could be a courier. I completely agree with this, but in my book that's also being a spy. You're working for an intelligence services. That's pretty spy-like. Considering our behavior, I'm inclined to believe the professional spies. Okay. I mean, professional spies have an agenda. <laughs> Like, I just don't believe it. The Isdor woman was a memorable woman traveling alone. Even 50 years later, witnesses who were re-interviewed when the case was reopened still remembered her. Her dark hair and eyes drew attention everywhere she went. Spies are supposed to blend and fit in, not stand out. Hotel staff also mentioned odd behavior, like, like changing rooms multiple times. In one hotel, she changed rooms three times. She moved furniture around in the room, and hotel staff just considered her to be strange and different. In Tanager, she was seen take, talking to a naval officer while visiting the same town where the Penguin missile system was being tested. If she was a spy, gathering intelligence by talking to the naval officer, standing on a key in plain sight for anyone to see would make her an incredibly bad spy. Maybe. Or it could be one of those things where it's like, yeah, okay, we'll just meet in the pub and talk, and we'll just say we're friends. It's like, maybe it's so bad it's good. There are many unsolved mysteries surrounding the Isdor woman, and her behavior seems suspicious. However, if she was involved in espionage, she probably wasn't a career spy. She was simply too memorable for that. So if not a spy, what else could she have been involved with that got her killed? Well, I mean, I feel like we're defining spy here as someone who specifically works for an intelligence agency directly. But I don't think that's what a spy is. Generally, like most of the spying and stuff happens by people that are recruited by people who work for intelligence agencies. Right? Right. The, 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 they're like people who work for like MI6 or whatever. They're like the, the officer, like the case officer or whatever. And then they go out and they find their informants and their spies and they go around and do stuff like this. I call that spying. And I think she's a spy. <laughs> Other theories. A number of theories have done the rounds since the discovery of the unknown woman on that winter's morning. However, no theory has given a satisfying explanation for who the Isdor woman was and what she was involved with. No matter how good the theory, there's always something that doesn't quite fit. A woman traveling alone in the 1970s probably had one of three occupations. Spy, sex worker, or businesswoman. Considering that she used multiple identities, none of which could be traced, and that she lied about her age, it's unlikely she was a legitimate businesswoman or a tourist, and we already considered spy. That leaves sex worker or high-class escort. Since this was still illegal in most places, it would explain the fake identities and lying about her age. Among the belongings, yeah, but come on, the cut-off labels, her being burned, the, it's like, n n what? Among the belongings in the suitcases at the train station was a matchbox with the label of an erotic underwear postal service in Germany that has since become a well-known chain of sex shops. This would certainly explain why she had so much money to spend and why all the witnesses saw her in the company of men. Okay. If she was traveling around Europe, she must have been in high demand, so this lady had some skills. However, police reports describe the lingerie in her luggage as beautiful, which doesn't necessarily mean erotic. And I think we can all agree that calling a woman a sex worker because she, because she likes to wear pretty undergarments is highly problematic. 
As for the matchbox, she could have picked that up anywhere. German soldiers were a dime a dozen in Bergen, so someone could have lost it or left it behind in a pub or a restaurant. It's also worth noting that some of the hotels she checked into were Christian hotels with strict rules such as no alcohol or drugs and definitely no sex workers. In fact, Hor der Heimen in Bergen, where she spent her last days accounted for, was a Christian hotel, as was St. Svithen in Stavanger, where she spent nine days. A Christian hotel isn't a good place to pick up clients or to take clients if you're a working girl. You'll probably get kicked out at best and reported to the authorities if you're really unlucky. So I doubt that our unknown woman had anything to do with the sex trade. Yes, agreed, because she's a spy! A more likely theory to explain the extensive traveling and the funds to support this lifestyle, while still turning heads with your elegance, would be crime. More than one of her hotel registration cards listed her reason for visiting as an antiquities dealer. An antiquities dealer could visit out-of-the-way places under the guise of evaluating antiques and meet with high-profile or sophisticated-looking men in hotel restaurants without drawing too much attention. Her interest in the Penguin Missile System could suggest that she was involved in the arms trade or she was selling information to the highest bidder. Stavanger was the oil capital of Norway, so lots of corporate officers for a little corporate espionage to fill up a lazy afternoon okay corporate espionage still espionage that's still spying i just have a broader definition of spy an antiques dealer would also be a good cover for an art thief or a smuggler one witness saw her buying a mirror a flat canvas hidden behind a cheap mirror would certainly be a good way to get a stolen painting out of norway if our fishermen could get a gun all the way to london getting a mirror over the border wouldn't be that difficult any of the cities she traveled to like paris and geneva are still connected to the art world and a lot of artworks were stolen during world war ii most of them not having been recovered Considering her childhood ties to Germany, this would certainly be a possibility. However, since Norway isn't exactly one of the art capitals of the world, I'm not convinced there were enough remarkable works of art or buyers in Bergen, Stavanger, and Tanager to justify so many trips to Norway. Of course, 34 paintings from well-known artists, including Edward Munch, that's the guy who painted the scream, disappeared from Oslo 50 years ago, but according to authorities, it was the work of students. I'm no expert, but this seems like something that warrants a little more investigation, so maybe someone might want to look into that. Finally, some have speculated that the Isda woman was suffering from some kind of mental illness. No, too organized too much money while much progress had been made in the field by 1970 many psychiatric conditions weren't that well understood and people suffering from mental illness were often overlooked and shunned by society the life of a spy sex worker or criminal would probably be very lonely so our woman might have experienced depression some of her odd behaviors that point to her not being a spy certainly make sense for someone experiencing paranoid delusions changing hotel rooms moving from one hotel to another frequently wearing wigs using fake names getting rid of anything that could identify her and keeping a coded itinerary would make perfect sense to someone trying to avoid imaginary followers what and then just cutting the i mean the clothes off sure but like then just killing herself or getting killed in the woods by fire and petrol that disappeared come on one article mentioned that the phenomal tablets found in her stomach could have been prescribed for seizures, which might indicate that our woman suffered from epilepsy. However, delusions aren't a typical symptom of epilepsy. <laughs> yes, I was like, where is that going? While a mental illness might explain her behavior, it doesn't explain the meetings with several unidentified men, her views, her visits coinciding with missile tests, or the source of her funding. A rich socialite going missing would have made the headlines. She also came across as organized and functioning relatively well. Exactly. She definitely had some quirks, even perhaps even some mild mental health issues, but full-blown paranoid delusions or schizophrenia seems unlikely in my opinion. There was some speculation also that the Isda woman was the victim of an unknown serial killer, or that the various sightings of the Isda woman weren't actually the same person, but two different women. Apparently the police were looking for an American woman whose description was very similar to the Isda woman at the time. In my humble opinion, someone should take another look at the paintings that went missing in Oslo. My money is on art thief or smuggler. What do you think, Simon? No. As you well know, my money is on spy. Don't know what sort of spy? Corporate espionage? Soviet espionage? Those are my two big ones. That's what I think's going down. Conclusion. It's been over 50 years, and the identity of the Isda woman is still unknown. No passports were ever found in her belongings or hotel rooms. If they existed, they probably burned with her. What she was doing in Norway remains as much of a mystery as her name. However, the interest of the Norwegian secret police suggests that her death wasn't a run-of-the-mill accident or suicide. Was she a spy, a double agent, or working either with a criminal organization or the police to infiltrate a criminal organization? Whether related to espionage or just play, plain crime, it appears that Our Lady was up to something shady, possibly shady enough to get her killed in a most horrific way. Despite being seen in the presence of multiple men, no one has ever come forward to identify the woman or even admit that they knew her, and time's running out. Within another 10 or 20 years, anyone who ever met her will be dead and gone, and with them, any answers that might lead to her killer.
With no history, no story, no name, all that remains of the Isdal woman is a lonely, unmarked grave and a mystery which at this point may never be solved. It's doubtful that we'll ever get to know who the Isdal woman is, who she loved, and what she imagined her life would be. And that's where we end today's episode. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoy it, leave a rating or a review on Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, or if you're watching on YouTube, like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.